So hopefully you've all pulled up the slides. And today, after doing Act 1 last week, uh, last week we looked at starting in the status quo, uh, resisting change, pulling our character out of the status quo, starting to break our world's status quo, cracking it a little bit with an inciting incident, calling our character onto an adventure, into their own transformation. Of course, the character is resistant to change, resistant to the adventure, afraid to go, uh, refuses the call, and then eventually we'll find some sort of uh, overcoming, you know, resilience inside of themselves. Uh, maybe it's a mentor, maybe it's a lightsaber, uh, some kind of supernatural aid or whatever that uh, encourages the hero uh, to believe that they can they can pursue the journey. And then they cross the threshold. Crossing the threshold, they go uh, into the tornado, down the rabbit hole, into the belly of the whale. Uh, and we uh, we're talking about through the wardrobe. Um, um, and of course, in the matrix, through the mirror, and so on and so on, uh, into the dream. Crossing the threshold into dream might be one of the easiest thresholds to remember. The threshold of falling asleep and that liminal space between wake and sleep. That liminal space between wake and sleep is that threshold that you cross as you transition from being awake to entering your dreams. And that's the same as act one to act two. We're going to go from the waking world. We're going to go from life at home into the dream, into the journey. Think of the journey as that dream other world, that place where we're going to go and transform and have experiential, uh, exciting uh, lessons. So today, the uh, primary steps in Act 2, we're going to first um, talk about some of the things that Act 2 needs to accomplish, uh, which is it needs to develop, uh, cultivate further conflict. And then we're going to talk about the major steps in Act 2 according to these narrative structures. Uh, first, kind of entering into this belly of the whale experience, what happens when you get to the other world, when you first go into the deep end, when you first get shocked by the cold. Same thing, when COVID first happened, it's like, whoa, where am I? What's going on? And this is one of the things that happens when you are an initiate into a secret mystery society. You wear a blindfold. Beginning, early in the initiation. You're going to wear a blindfold because you can't know what's going on. So when you first, that's one of the first beats of getting to the other world. And you know what? That's going to tell the audience that this is a really weird world because the character doesn't know how to handle it. It communicates that we're out of water and we don't know what's going on. Uh, so this is that first kind of major step in the other world. And then we're going to start develop. We're going to learn how to handle this world. And in learning how to handle this world, this world is finely tuned to make sure that we learn how to grow in the way we need to grow. Remember the mind worm? So this is a dream made for us, made for our character. And as we learn how to operate in this world, we're also cultivating the skills that we need to cultivate in ourselves that are missing, that have been lacking. And we're going to groove right on up to where we think things are going to go the way we think they're going to go. And then they're not. That's going to be the midpoint. Neo, you're the one. Let's go take you and find out. The Oracle's going to tell you you're the one. Neo, you're not the one. We're going to go to Alderaan and we're going to get Leia and then we're going to go save the galaxy. Okay, we get to Alderaan. It's exploded. There's a Death Star. It's bringing us in on their tractor beam. What's going on to Harry Potter at the midpoint of the first Harry Potter? He's on a broom going all over the place, losing control. Midpoint is when you lose control. And what you thought your plan was going to be is now thrown off. What your volition, what your will said, I'm going on this journey to do, is now thrown off. And the other thing that happens at the midpoint is we transition from, you know, first we're in the other world, we're training, you know, we're becoming Batman, you know, we're becoming Iron Man, we're making our suit, we're becoming Spider-Man, we're learning how to sing, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, right? We're, we're learning, we're growing, cool. Midpoint is going to yank us back to the plot, what's really going on in the world. You're going to shift from that. So that fun part, it's one of our favorite parts of stories, is in between the end of Act 1 and the midpoint. That's when our characters just grow and just expand and train. Don't you love watching those, those training sequences? We all love training sequences. We can feel ourselves training and growing. That's that first half of act two. But then we gotta get away from the training sequence. We gotta get focused on the plot again. And that midpoint's gonna take us that direction. And as it does, things are gonna start getting bad, problematic, as we start to approach some kind of major event. And in, in the approach, there will be some, this will be the big ordeal, and the ordeal is quite an event. There will be a kind of death of an ego, but then there will also be kind of a, a discovery of a new insight. And what's going to happen is, remember that this is uh, the very bottom of the underworld now. When you're in the nadir, 
the bottom. That's what the ordeal is. The ordeal is what happens at the bottom. And what happens at the bottom? We change directions from going down to going up. That is the ordeal, the achievement of the changing of directions. That is the climax of act two, the achievement of the changing of directions from going further and further down, down, deep, deep, worse, worse. And now we got to we got to actually, you know, kill the ego or something like this, lose Obi-Wan, lose our mentor, uh, something bad. But then at the same time, find that special spark, get that thing we need. And this is when you get the grail. And then the climax of act three is going to be when you deliver the grail to save the world. So the end of act three, the climax of act three, you might get the elixir. You've got that little bitty bit of elixir you're going to use to save the world. The climax of act three, you're delivering the elixir to the world. You're saving the whole world. This is crucial because when you're trying to make a good story, it's too hard not to end up with an A and a B story. The way you have a climactic middle, this is one of the crucial ways to achieve a climactic middle in addition to a climactic end, which gives you the movement that you really want for a full feature or you know any great story. That climactic middle can be achieved when you use it to get the thing you need to achieve the climactic end. And you also use that climactic middle to have something really negative and bad happen. Somebody dies, we lose, uh, the plan doesn't go as we expected. So that's just a quick overview of act two. And then act three, we're gonna bring that elixir back, we're gonna deliver it home, we're gonna save the world, we're gonna be reborn and all that good stuff. But before we do that, let's focus in on act two uh, and now expand what we just talked about. And again, you can look at this as another way to look at the overview. Same thing. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so just as a quick reminder, uh, this is what we're looking at. Oops. We're looking at the waning of the moon. Act two is when the moon wanes from the half moon to the new moon. It's when the sun goes down from sunset all the way to the darkness of midnight. It's when the year goes from fall and we're starting to see death and fall of leaves and harvest of fruits all the way down to the deep death of winter and cold. That's where we're going in the first half of act two, all the way from the surface of just from crossing the threshold all the way down to the bottommost place of the underworld. And that first spark of act three is going to be when we first change directions the other direction. And so the key here is that we're going to do these narrative models. We're going to talk about some terms like road of trials or belly of the whale or, uh, or the ordeal. But what I want to remind you is, is that you benefit from learning those terms, but you already know the basic curve of this narrative. You already know the story of the moon going down till empty. You already know the story of the sun from sunset to midnight. And if you keep that in mind, if you keep act two in mind, it's just the sunset to midnight. It's just the fall equinox to the winter solstice. Then you've already got it down. You've already got it in you. And start to use that knowledge to bootstrap in these movie terms that they're all using. OK, and then you'll see these on your slides. I hope you guys have your slides open just to get a little zoom in. Right. So the ordeal itself is when that last little, little bit of light goes out. There's the death of the ego. And then that first little light comes back. That's the discovery of the elixir, the seizing of the sword. Uh, here's a nice little example of the bull's head with the double axe right here, a great symbol. And this double axe is the double crescent moon. And the bull's horns are also the double crescent moon. So you're seeing a synthesis of the uh, two images. And remember that surrealistic idea? So eventually, you know, you might want to see a, uh, a bull axe. <laughs> uh, and of course you would. So here we have uh, this idea of the decapitation of the bull, by the way. Oh, I didn't talk about this with the last class. They really missed out. This is one of my favorite insights. Okay, the decapitation of the bull is in, for example, in the labyrinth, right? Theseus goes to the center of the labyrinth and cuts the head off the bull. Well, not only does he cut the head off the bull, but in ancient Crete, their sacred drinking vessels, their holy grails, some of them were shaped like bull's heads and they would drink their elixir, their wines out of the bull's head. So you see, it's not just 
a symbol of death, but also a symbol of elixir. And this is also true with the head of Medusa. When Medusa's head is cut off, one vein drips elixir that will heal anything, and another vein drips poison. Together, they call it a pharmacon, a healing poison. Uh, but here uh, you have when we decapitate the moon, sorry, we decapitate the bull, it's decapitating the moon. So you see the crescent horns of the moon when it goes out and the moon goes dark. That's the decapitation of the bull. When we go from the last little crescent moon to darkness, that's the decapitation of the moon. And this is why the decapitation of the bull or the minotaur in the labyrinth is associated with the um, uh, uh, eclipse, with the lunar eclipse. This is when we have, when the moon just goes dark, that final little cutting off of that last sliver of light of the bull horns, that's the decapitation. But also the moon now is going to come back and now we're going to drink out of the bull horn. Anyway, okay, there's our, our ordeal. One of my favorite scenes from myth. I really want you to get that. When you see the moon and you see it going dark, that's the decapitation of the bull. That's the ordeal. And then when you see that light just starting to come back, that's that elixir of light. That's that uh, the bull's head that has the elixir in it. We would drink from the bull's horn. The bull's horn is very associated with the cornucopia, a symbol of abundance and life. All right, enough fun on that. Okay, act two, let's move through it. I'm gonna go back to our, um, I'm gonna change my screen share over to the web page. Hope you guys are on it because some of these clips are long and I'm gonna ask you to play them. Okay, and where's my web page? There we go. Okay. Oh, by the way, that event that I invited y'all to, I'm really excited about it. I'll share it with you. Keep keep your eye out for some news. Hushin's decided to come on and sponsor it. Uh, me, but so has um, ScreenCraft, which is the world's largest screenwriting community. Uh, 80,000 screenwriters. Uh, so as Esalen, uh, Esalen's the largest uh, retreat center in the West Coast. They're sending out to their newsletter this week. Very excited about that. Another, of course, 80,000 people for them. Uh, Max Senate Studios, which hosted our graduation one year uh, over here. It's like the longest running, I think it is the longest running studio in Hollywood, um, agreed to uh, come on and partner and sponsor as has a series of others. So we're really excited. The event's gonna be really big. We expect thousands of people, film educators, uh, filmmakers, mythologists, people just thinking about their own life and transformation. And um, I'll do an introduction that introduces some of, some of the stuff we're talking about in this class. But ultimately what it's gonna be about is the 25th anniversary of, um, uh, as I mentioned before, the 25th anniversary of The Writer's Journey, which is one of the books that we're using in this course, one of the actual real pillars. Okay, I wanted to share that with y'all. All right. Where did we go? Lost Teams meeting. There we go. Okay. All right. So you remember, of course, uh, also in addition to these cycles of the of light, embedded in what we're going through are these different theories, right? So here's Save the Cat, here's the uh, story structure of McKee and Field, a little bit of Campbell, the Night Sea Journey, um, Jungian Individuation, Arnold Van Gennep's uh, Rites of Passage, Nietzsche's sto Allegory of Man. Uh, these are all these narrative structures that are beneath the one that we're focusing in on today, which is here. So uh, in Act Two, Aristotle, who really deserves a little bit of attention, uh, Aristotle's really who focused on giving us an Act Two in some ways. I mean, it happened. He was just commenting on the fact that plays uh, need a beginning, middle, and end, and this is something that um, McKee really champions. Middles, middles. Don't forget the middle. We all are good at thinking of the beginning and the end. The middle is the hardest part of a story. How do you have a rich middle? How do you have a middle worth having instead of just set up and pay off? Middle is the hardest part for a lot of early writers. You gotta figure out what to do in the middle. 
Uh, and in the middle uh, is what Gannett calls the liminal. You're in the space between. This is between waking and sleeping, for example, right? Or the dream between your two days. This is a transitional time, an in-between space. And if you ever stood on a ledge, you feel that feeling in your gut, you're uncomfortable on a ledge. Even if you're not scared of heights, you feel it, whoo, you know. That's what it's like to be in that liminal space. So that's where we are in the middle, in the second act. We're in this liminal space. Campbell described it as an initiation. This is the place of initiation. So in the first act, we're separating from who we are, who we were, are, <laughs> who we were. In the second act, we're going to initiate into who we're going to become. And then in the third act, we're going to show the world who we've become and come back as that person. Field, uh, his main focus is confrontation. Make sure act two has confrontation. You're setting up confrontations in act one, but those confrontations are all gonna start to happen in act two. Start having these things you're setting up clash. You know, your main, your bad guys are gonna start clashing against your good guys, your characters that are gonna start clashing against each other, even friends, confrontation. And then this is also, you might describe it as conflict. But conflict is a little bit more, you know, nuanced. So confrontation is confrontation, conflict between two people, perhaps. Uh, conflict might be, you know, okay, I'm, I've got to cross the street and I've got a thousand things to carry and I can barely, barely hold it all and I've got to balance this watermelon. And that's conflict. The, anything that's hard is conflict. So conflict is just any kind of escalated challenge, any kind of escalated problem. And that's another major focus of Act 2. Lots and lots of conflict. So set up your conflict, but start having your conflict happen in Act 2. And also the other way to handle Act 2 is just to keep having more and more things happen. Right? Act 2 is when things get progressively complicated. You set up the problem in Act 1. You kind of have an idea of what the basic challenge is going to be, right? We're going to go get Leia, and then we're going to you know, go blow up the Death Star. Okay, but then Act Two comes, and now there's a challenge. We can't just get Leia. Now we got to go into this whole thing, and we got to do this blah, blah, whole project, and then eventually we'll come back to the original plan, which is to have Leia and blow up the Death Star. So Act Two will often expand the scope of what you think the story was going to be, and that's going to get us through Act Two. Okay, so that's an overview. Now we've done the introduction of Act Two, and now we're going to start going through each step. A little bit with a little bit more detail. So um, I'd like you all to watch the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Please click this clip. This is the last movie that Heath Ledger made. It's a six minute clip. It's currently 1113. Let's come back at 1120 and talk about it together. I'm going to mute mine so that you can't hear it. That way, you can all play it on your screen. Okay, enjoy. Oh, it's hard for me to not watch it. I love this sequence.
Oops. Okay. I've got this link for you here. So if any of you are interested in the COVID journey with Chris Vogler, uh, put together by one of the fellow students, check that out. Okay, so um, somebody want to tell me any about what we just saw? Uh, tell me how that was. a. First of all, what we saw uh, the first half was a character that was crossing a threshold, right? We saw a threshold that was a mirror, but also a backstage. What a great threshold, right? Backstage. The, what is the world in front stage and behind the stage? The persona and the behind the scenes of the psyche, right? And in this case, it was actually behind the scenes of the psyche. We actually went into uh, Dr. Parnassus' psyche, right, by going behind the mirror and into this world. So uh, tell me more, though, about this belly of the whale experience. What did y'all see in that, uh, in that sequence? Lillian, are you talking to me? 
I'm not going to lie. I have absolutely no clue what I just watched. Um, <laughs> I, th- it was enjoyable, but I have absolutely no clue what I just watched. Well, that's actually a pretty good way to describe the belly of the whale. Just completely overwhelming imagery. What the hell is going on? Um, totally confused. So this, and that's, that's what's supposed to be happening to this guy. He's totally confused. He's like, where am I? What is going on? I'm like, I'm lost. Why would this even be happening? And then he like falls and he's like, and then we show him in a pit, even in the other world, in the dream of Parnassus, uh, he's in a pit beneath that with his face in the mud. And then he ends up uh, in this other place, like deep in his own psyche, uh, seeing his own habitual problems with drinking uh, and represented by these bottles. And this is kind of, this also is a belly of the whale for the audience because it's throwing us into the center of the story and also showing us how it works. So when Dorothy gets to Oz, at first she's like, whoa, color, pretty. And she's like blown away by all these munchkins. But at the same time, the munchkins tell her how Oz works. And they're like, this is what to prepare for and what's going on. And so the same thing happens here. It's a completely disorienting sequence. And we see how the story is going to work. It's going to be all about saving souls from making the choice that that soul made. It's going to be all about getting people to make the right choice, to take the noble path instead of the bad choice to, to become bad people. Seriously, seriously fun movie. It's the same guy that did Monty Python and the Holy Grail um, and uh, Baron Munchausen. Uh, really fun guy, really fun movie. Um, and actually, uh, the way they put it together, it's probably one of his... Yeah, Heath Ledger does an amazing job. And it's crazy that Heath Ledger is like, going to die before he finishes this movie when you're watching it. Okay, so the belly of the whale. We talked about it a little bit before. The belly of the whale is when you feel uh, just you've just entered the other world. You're completely overwhelmed. You don't know what's going on. You've just been swallowed. Uh, and now you need to be, one, introduced to what this world is. And the introduction is overwhelming. It's perfect. It's perfect. You need to introduce the world and you need the character to be overwhelmed. So you overwhelm the world via an introduction. A harsh, fast, intense introduction to this world. And uh, that's the basic idea of the belly of the whale. I hope you'll go back through and watch some of these clips on your own. I'm bummed that the Matrix, I don't think the Matrix ones, I think it's blocked. Uh, yeah. Bummer. No, no, the Doctor Strange one's the one that's blocked. Make sure. Because that was another really good one. What happens in Doctor Strange is that they, you know, he just shows up uh, when he finally gets to the other world and he's being introduced to the mystical realm. She just pushes him into the mystical realm and he's just, holy shit, overwhelmed right away, right? That's a perf- another perfect example. Okay, so now after this overwhelming experience, now we're going to train Doctor Strange. We're going to train... Uh, Luke, we're going to train these characters so that they can learn how to operate and navigate in this world. So let's see a couple examples of some road of trials. Uh, this one, I think we've got some short clips. So let me let me play for you. Let's see. Of course, the Wizard of Oz, the Yellow Brick Road, perfect example of a road of trials. It is a road on which she has a series of trials, meets a series of friends, and learns and will ultimately, by adding these friends will learn how to integrate what these friends represent. So let me see, where's the one I wanted to show? Oh, here we go, Uh, Mary Poppins. Oh, why is it not? Oh, that's right, I need to show it on my screen, hold on. But I have it here, let's do Spider-Man. So why don't you guys just watch Spider-Man on my screen for this one?
fly. Up, up, and away, Web. Shazam. Go, 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 Web, go. Okay, let's watch an Iron Man too. Oh wait, that one's not loaded up either. Oh come on. Oh wait, no, it's probably. Oh, we watched the Iron Man one, didn't we? Let's watch Fellowship of the Rings. What? Oh, that's right. Hold on, changing screen share. That's my problem. So what you saw there was Spider Man. While I pull this up, is Spider Man is learning his skills. He's new to his skills, and he's decided he's going to go on this adventure of initiating into himself and becoming himself and who he's going to be. This is when Batman's doing his cool training and figuring out how he's who he's going to be and how that's going to work. Uh, this is how this is when Iron Man is building the Iron Man suit. Uh, and then what I want to show you, uh, one of the ones that I is really just worth making this change over here for to make sure you see is Mary Poppins. Y'all are musicians, so let's do that. Or y'all are involved with the music world, many of you. Oh, come back. There we go. Mary Poppins. Um, are we supposed to be watching this on our own? Because I can't click it, but also you don't have your sound on. You can't hear it? No. Also, it's not sound I off. can't hear it either. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Let's try this again. You can probably like hear it going through my microphone, which is probably even more tricky. Okay, try again. So... Also, isn't that Sound of Music not Mary Poppins? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, so funny. Yes, you you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're totally right. Oh my god. Now, why Okay, here's a question. Why do you think I made that comparison? What do you think? I mean, it's the same actress in both of them, so... They're both and it's the same cool. role, too, right? Yeah. This this uh, teacher-mother figure who's going to come in and, and uh, you know, teach the kids how to be and sing. <laughs> yeah, so I could have done a spoonful of sugar on for the same sequence, right? Okay, cool. Yes. All right, well, let's skip that one. You've got an idea of what's going to happen, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. So uh, you know what's going on. She's teaching them how to sing. So as they're learning how to sing, she's, they're also learning how to be, you know, well-behaved. And they're also um, uh, nonstop. I'm going to actually, I am going to show you this imagery because this is part of the point. Hold on. The real point, because this is part of your thematic imagery, uh, way of thinking about thematic imagery. Let me click. Uh, 
Okay. So why are they on? Okay. Why are they on bikes? On a road. And then next, in a car, on a road, or a buggy. And then next, walking around on a street. And then going down a path. And then walking down another path. You see? They're on road after road after road for a reason. Because we don't want to, because if you're going to set a dream, if you're going to write the dream scene of, you know, uh, teaching them how to sing and them learning how to do something. Well, what we ended up doing is we ended up doing all the thematic imagery on a road. So it feels like we're moving forward. We're traveling, we're learning, we're going forward. All of every single one of those background scenes, they, they set it, they set the sequence on a road. Why? That's why. Is this gonna, what is this doing? I'm crazy. There we go. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what's next. Okay, so make sure you watch this clip when you watch it on the slides, too, because that one will give you some more, uh, a nice little montage. Okay, so I want to share with you some different ideas of some different types of mythological trials. So these are different types of roads of trials that have inspired the idea of what a road of trials is in our movies. So what are the different types of mythic trials that have brought us here? And I'm going to do a, I'm going to just do a really kind of annoying little wordplay where I try to pull it all together. A journey is a questing odyssey and a road of trials through a labyrinth of labors that initiate the hero while alchemizing the substance and form of their being. So these are all different sources of the idea of the road of trials, an actual road of trials on a road, a journey down through a labyrinth, uh, which you see in Theseus and Grail Quest and even the movie Labyrinth with David Bowie or Inside Out. Uh, you see the Odyssey. This is like a journey, but in uh, a road of trials, but in the water. Of course, the Aeneid and the Odyssey, Sinbad and the Seven Seas. Um, then you see quests, a quest for a holy grail, a quest for the lost ark, or a quest for the dark crystal. Um, oops, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, dark crystal. Okay, pilgrimages. Uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca, to Jerusalem, to the holy center. Think of that as one of the things your journey is. Your journey is to some kind of center of this world. The oracle is in the center in a certain way center of a certain piece of knowledge, a memory, center of, of a certain way that this world came to be. So a lot of times the roads are to some kind of central location, uh, to Mecca, Jerusalem, Santiago, Superman goes to Krypton, Luke goes to the new, in the new Star Wars, Luke goes to the place where um, uh, the Jedi kept. The road is also an initiation sequence. So Hercules, Persephone, Avatar, the air up there, these are all these initiations. It's also, the road of trials is also inspired by the series of labors, right? So we see in the movie Hercules, you know, he does labor after labor after labor on his road of trials phase. And also you might see that um, these are also initiations. So one of the interesting things about Hercules is his 12 labors may actually be 12 initiations into 12 ancient mystery cults. What? 12 labors, 12 mystery cults. So, uh, oops, another one. Digestion is another layer. Oops, come back. Digestion is another layer of the road of trials. We talk about a journey through the bowels of hell or something like this, right? There we go. Uh, alchemy and kundalini. Oops. While this finds its slide, I'm going to bring us back a kundalini from Tibet. Okay, so the Kundalini, the Kundalini is a Tibetan idea, not Tibetan idea, I'm sorry, it's a uh, Eastern idea, probably, uh, I believe it starts with the um, uh, Sikhs, but it becomes adopted throughout a lot of India and eventually into Tibet, and it's this core idea. And now, you probably are offered Kundalini yoga sessions when you go to yoga, and you're all dancers, so I'm sure you've all tried yoga at least once, and somebody's tried to talk you into checking out Kundalini yoga. This is what Kundalini yoga is really about, a quick introduction. So Kundalini yoga is this idea that you have going up your spine, going up your spine, I don't know where I'm at on the screen, but going up your spine, 
you have uh, these chakras, these energy wheels. That's what a chakra is, is an energy wheel. And so the idea is that you want to raise the energy to be fully active up your spine, right? So what's going to happen is, is that the idea of the story goes is that there's a root energy, there's a serpent of energy coiled at the base of your spine. And the same way that uh, you would rise, raise a certain serpent out of a basket with a flute, you're going to raise the serpent out of the basket of your own base to raise this energy up through your whole spine. And this is going to be a path of enlightenment because by adding, seeing things in these new ways, you're going to become increasingly enlightened. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a lesson on Kundalini enlightenment, a little snapshot. Let me make sure first that you guys, because I'm not sure what you guys are seeing. Let's see here. Make sure you guys can see my screen. Okay. So here, oh, and I'll stop the screen share so that you can see this better. Okay. So we start with the Mahamudra chakra, the very bottom chakra. The bottom chakra is red. The, then we go red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. That's also the rainbow, right? So the Kundalini is also a raising of frequencies from the low frequencies to the high frequencies, from red to purple. And this is ancient. The color scheme here is ancient. Uh, so then what happens is you start with the root chakra. The root chakra is your earth chakra, your root this chakra is literally around your anus, associated with your shit. You make stuff. You make shit. And that is your root chakra. This is associated with your inner materialist drive, your drive towards material things. You need to eat. You need to have things. You want to make things. You want to live in a world of things. This is materialism. This chakra is associated with the materialistic way of thinking. So first, you raise your energy into the first energy level in a materialistic way. Now your second chakra, you go from red to yellow, you go from a uh, red to uh, orange, and you go from one to two. Well, two, two is about duality. Two is about pairing. And what's above your anus? Your genitals. And so the second chakra is sexual. The second chakra is about the union of opposites. It's about, or it's about the opposites. It's about sexuality. It's about your, uh, so this is very much about the tension, the desire to bring opposites together. It's a very sexual drive. So first we go from our earthly earth, you know, being driven by materialism. Here we're driven by sexuality and the attraction to opposites. We're going to raise our energy again. Now, when we raise our energy again to the next level, we're going to add to it an emphasis on uh, will. So what's above your, your sexual uh, you know, organs or your gut, your stomach? This is, where you, uh, this is where you digest. So you're combusting. This is your fire. So you're going to eat and digest and generate fire in your gut, fire in the belly. And the fire in your belly is your will. So this is a narrative structure, right? This is how it's used sometimes. It can be used as a narrative structure in, the, in 2020, and it has been, where your character starts very materialistic, and then you get them to be very uh, move into a more sexual emphasis, and then into a power of their will. I can, I have the will, I have the strength. But above the will and the fire is the heart and the air. And this chakra thinks in terms of love. It sees everything as love. Its solution to everything is love. So we've gone from materialism. Now we've activate, activated our sexuality. Now we've activated our will. And now we've activated our heart and our love. And above love, above the heart, is now going to be the throat, courage, the strength of your voice to speak and stand tall with what you believe in. This isn't just like your will. It's you know, I can and I have that strength, but courage is something more profound. Courage is on the strength of love. Courage is on the strength of your philosophy. As Socrates said, courage is primarily of the philosophical disposition. And his idea of philosophy was that love was the ultimate answer in his philosophy. So you might say Socrates believed that courage is primarily of the disposition of love. 
And that's what you achieve with your uh, uh, fifth chakra, your throat chakra. And it's associated with ether, with like lightning. Now above this, you see this duality here, these two, two-ness. That two-ness is associated with the brain, with the mind. This is the sixth chakra. And in the sixth chakra, you unify opposites. You bring the opposites together. You see the overall wholenesses in all things. And you see that all the opposites come together in a union. And then when you get through that point in the sixth chakra, you'll see the emptiness in all things. And you'll see that all the opposites are simply empty and beneath them is a union. And so you'll finally in the sixth chakra, this is the moksha, emptiness, transcendence. So when you've achieved the kundalini path, you've activated all these energies at once. You've brought in your uh, root chakra, focus on materialism, your sexuality and the attention with opposites, your drive for power and will and your fire, your heart and your love, your courage and your strength, your knowledge and your mastery of all duels, and then ultimately your ability to let go and feel emptiness and transcend. That is the road of growth. That's the Kundalini Yoga. And so Kundalini Yoga is about meditating into all of those modalities and activating all those modalities in yourself. So uh, I believe that sometimes they've even used that as a sequence for uh, <laughs> uh, political rallies because it can be a very powerful energetic rising when you move from one of these energies to the next as a meta structure, as a hidden narrative structure. So one thing that's interesting is that the Kundalini is a narrative that is from up to down, it's from, from the bottom to the top. So you're climbing. This isn't a hero's circle. This is a climb. This is a climb. It's like climbing a mountain. And that's why it's so influential in a movie called Holy Mountain. Holy Mountain is a movie that was banned in this country for decades because the sixth Beatle had a major problem with it. And that's a whole story. Uh, but what you're going to see here in this clip I'm going to show you is that this movie, this band movie, really cool culty movie, synthesizes the Kundalini as a narrative structure with the tarot as a narrative structure. Because the tarot, the tarot deck, some of you may know, goes from the fool all the way to the, the world. And the journey from fool to world is a journey of transformation and growth and enlightenment, you might say, coming into one's wholeness. Shifting from seeing yourself as the isolated fool to identifying with the with the world itself. So what's happened with the uh, what you're going to see here in this clip is a movie that dared to synthesize the alchemical process, the kundalini process, the tarot process, and the climbing of a mountain into a narrative structure. Oh, and I'm going to share my screen again. Prepare yourself for very weird. The rainbow, of course, too. Alejandro Jodorowsky's The Holy Mountain. See those are the chakras? The Holy Mountain is a film completely outside the entire tradition of motion picture art. And you'll see tarot cards and you'll see uh, you'll see the rest in there. Very weird movie. OK, so that's just some fun stuff on the road of trials. Now we've got 15 minutes left. Oopsie. So one thing that's really important to mention is that. In the road of trials, the characters developing a function that they did not otherwise have. Right. So let's say that you in your dream when you go into a dream, your dream doesn't work like the daily world works, right? You can't just like, you know, expect things to be deterministic and causal and normal in the real world. No way. In the dream, things are crazy. So when you go into a dream, you have a chance to cultivate a different set of skills. And that's the most important thing is that we're developing the thing that's in what Jung calls the inferior function, which is, you know, those functions that we are not otherwise cultivating, that we've left to decay, 
a skill that has not been developed. Maybe a man hasn't developed the strength of their inner femininity. Maybe somebody who is, um, you know, uh, maybe somebody has the skill to be a musician but never cultivated it because they wanted, they felt like they had to be a lawyer because their dad made them feel that way. What is that that skill that's been in decay? That's what we're going to cultivate. Okay, 